Hey everyone, it's Vossi. Welcome back to V Birchwood. So today we have something a little bit different for you, and that is an interview with the fashion historian Cass McGann. Cass is a phenomenal fashion historian with over 25 years of experience, and we sat down together to bust some of the most common corset myths. On top of being an amazing fashion historian, Cass also began the pattern company Reconstructing History back in 1996. Now the way her and I got connected is because I've actually made quite a few of Reconstructing History's patterns. Both the brown riding habit that I've made and the blue riding habit jacket are modified patterns from Reconstructing History. So if you're just starting out and you're looking for a historical pattern company that can help you along your historical fashion journey, be sure to check out Reconstructing History and I've put a link down in the bio below. In a few weeks, we'll be releasing another video, which is going to be more common corset myths. So if you're interested in learning more about the truth of historical corsetry, be sure to subscribe so that way you can get notified when that video does get released. Let everyone know who you are and, you know, what do you do? Because obviously I think you're a very fascinating person. Hi, I'm Cass McGann and I own Reconstructing History Patterns. I'm a costume historian and I've been working in this profession for 25 years. Great, thank you Cass, and I'm so happy to have you here today to do this interview. It's really exciting to be able to have such an experienced professional in the industry um, discuss this very important topic about historical corsetry and corsets in general. You know, I'm not an expert by any means, I just wear corsets daily, so for me it's just a personal experience, so I really didn't feel qualified to be able to give good advice about dispelling some of the common corset myths because Obviously, I'm not an expert, which is why I thought this would be the perfect opportunity for us to collaborate and to do sort of this interview together. That way you could provide a lot of the information about what is the truth behind the common corset myths. Well, I'm happy to answer any questions you have because there are sure tons of corset myths and most of them are just that myths what people think they know about corsets is largely incorrect yeah and unfortunately i don't think that a lot of the conversations going on in society are contributing to dispelling a lot of those myths obviously lately in the historical fashion community people have been talking about it a lot more but in general when you speak to someone about historical corsetry they assume you're just talking about waist trainers or something yeah. like that which is more of a modern conception so yeah maybe we could just begin with um, do you think that corsetry historical corsetry specifically is dangerous well no to put it very succinctly, absolutely not. However, I mean, anything can be dangerous really. When it comes right down to it, there are situations in which women were harmed by wearing corsets. However, if you're someone, for example, who has scoliosis very badly and you need to wear a back brace, there is no material difference between a modern medical back brace and a corset. It is basically based on the corset model to keep your spine in alignment. I have a friend who's in the 18th century reenactment community who does a lot of cooking over an open fire and she swears by her stay. She said, I could never pick up those heavy cast iron pots full of food if I wasn't wearing stays because the stays give support to her back. The downside of this is if you're someone who wears these things daily in your life, your musculature doesn't have to support you as much anymore. So your body relies on the corset to hold you up. So your muscles do get weaker. Harm, harm is very rare. It's not as harmful as we've been led to believe. One trick I actually do is I'll usually take weekends off and just wear jumps or corded corsets because I find then my, my muscles don't get atrophied, I guess it's called. Yeah. The kind of thing yeah. where your muscles get overly relaxed, because I was reading about that. People don't realize that women didn't always wear very boned corsets. Sometimes they also wore jumps and corded work corsets that were more flexible, which only offer that little bit of support that maybe would have been necessary to keep good posture, but not enough necessarily to cause the muscles to, to weaken. Modern reconstruction corsets largely use steel boning. Steel boning is really a rather late development. It's, it's an early 20th century development, in fact. So in the 18th century and the 19th century in particular, 
corsets were bones with what we call whalebone, which is baleen. Whalebone is the wrong word. <laughs> we say whalebone. It's not bone. They have these feeders that, that are in their mouths that help them because it's, it's the baleen whale. We, we, the more proper word for it is baleen. And the baleen whale, it filters plankton out of the, the, the sea. Baleen is keratinous. It's the same material as your fingernails. So when we think about, you know, being corseted and steel, it, it, it wasn't like that. It was incredibly flexible. You know, think of these incredibly long pieces of fingernail and how much give that has for the vast majority of the corseted time periods, the corseted centuries, women of all classes are wearing corsets bones with baleen and baleen is soft baleen is incredibly flexible but we have this idea in our heads that it's whale bone and bone is rigid and, and it, it's not at all it's it's not bone and you've probably seen these photos of these kind of scary looking corsets with like the grates where yeah. they're almost made out of like wood or metal like these torturous looking corsets and i think those types of images going around are really negative towards this positive corsetry movement. They make you think that they're like medieval torture devices, when in reality, this was just a bra, basically, yeah. before oh, a bra really. existed. You have to understand that the part of your body that a corset draws in is the only rigid thing in that area is your spine, and your spine is, is very small. So you have your spine, and then you have all of this soft tissue. And even your floating ribs, your, we call them your floating ribs for a reason. They only attach on one side. You know, there's a lot of fluff. So basically you pull in your waist and it makes your boobs look bigger <laughs> because it pushes, it pushes that flesh upwards and, and also downwards. You, one of the things with women wearing corsets, they look like they have huge hips because of the difference. It doesn't harm anything to squish that around a little bit. Maybe the next thing to go into then is the myth that all women tight laced. What would you define officially as tight lacing? What is the uh, amount that you would remove from your waist, for instance? In a corset, even today, you know, you and I, when we wear corsets, we're probably taking between two to six inches off our waist. And that's not tight lacing. That's, that's kind of normal lacing. That's wearing a corset that's snug. Tight lacing, I would define as over six inches. It, it yeah. was such an uncommon practice. I mean, when were you tight lacing? You weren't tight lacing when you were sitting around your house. and Maybe you weren't even tight lacing when you were hanging out with your friends. Certainly not when you were having dinner with your family. If you were tight lacing at all, or even if you weren't tight lacing per se, you would wear a more rigid corset if you were going out for example, to a ball or to a big dinner or something where you were going to be in the public and you're wearing, you know, a fab fabulous gown for, for the levels of society that did those kind of things. It makes sense that people would tight lace for that, but, you know, not on a daily basis. Tight lacing is incredibly rare. And the women who did it were typically in the entertainment professions. You know, we know their names and we have photographs of them because they published photographs of them to show how small their waists were. So there's that bias already that the photographs we are seeing are the exceptions and a lot of them are edited, the oh, white yeah. filler that they would do in the negative. You can kind of see it if you really look at some of the old Victorian photographs of women in corsets or in gowns where you can really see their prominent waist. If you just take a little bit of a closer look, you can see the white space and how they purposely picked a light background so that way it would blend really well. It's not a time period when you have snapshots. It's not a time period when you could do selfies with your friends. Every photograph was set up very, very carefully because you had to have the light correct and everything. And of course, the shutter involved taking the cap off the lens and then putting it back on again. Having a photograph taken was a very in intensive process. So if there's a photograph, there's no reason why you wouldn't also retouch it. Could you explain about how a lot of the stays and corsets earlier on before like the bustle era were actually pretty hard to tight lace just because of like yeah. the, the boning structure and the way that they are? No, no, you can't, you can't go beyond the bounds of what they're created for. And it's because they don't have metal grommets. 
the invention of metal grommets happens, oh, and I don't know the exact date because I'm a bad historian, but the invention of metal grommets happens I, probably in the 1860s. In the 1860s is when you start seeing corsets with metal grommets. And when you have you know, that, that metal circle that you're lacing through, you can pull on that with a lace and it won't tear the fabric. In the 18th century, 17th century, the early part of the 19th century, you were making stays and corsets with thread eyelets. You can only lace them as far as they were created to lace. I, I wear a lot of stays just with eyelet, hand sewn eyelets, and yep. you really can't get much more than maybe, for me, like an inch or two. And yeah. like, that's perfectly fine. It's, it's not to get a smaller waist. It's to just create that foundational surface, to be able to mm -hmm. put everything else on top of, and just to look like your garment really actually fits you. So that's actually a perfect transition to our next myth, which is corsets were worn on bare skin and they caused people to bleed. No, we see this no, time no. and time again in historical <laughs> period dramas, especially. I'm not gonna name any names, but we all know which one was the most recent one. What is this? Why do people think that this is a thing? Let me just state for the record that I think it's all about the scenes. So you want to have the woman in a corset next to her skin. You don't want to have a shift and petticoat and drawers and all of this other stuff because then it's it's not sexy to the modern eye. So I think that that's part of what builds the myth is we keep seeing it in movies and, and period dramas on TV because we want sexy. We want, you know, the Victoria's Secret corset. We don't want the reality of history. Corsets weren't the most under undergarment. You started out wearing a shift next to your skin and you never didn't wear a shift. The next thing we could transition into is the myth that corsets are so hot and they'll make you faint because you're not going to be able to wear them in the heat. What do you think about this, Cass? I, <laughs> I have opinions. Yeah, um, I know you do. <laughs> yeah, but they're also I, based on facts, so. <laughs> and, and they're based on experimental archeology span as well, right. uh, experimental anthropology. I once mowed a lawn in stays in the summer in Pennsylvania where it is not cool. And, and we're right next to the river. It was so swampy. It was so disgustingly humid. And when I say I mowed a lawn, I don't mean I pushed a lawn mower. I mean, I had a scythe. Okay, so I was imagining you sitting in 18th century clothing on top of one of those machine lawn mowers that you drive around. And I thought, wow, that would be kind of interesting. That would be like historical anachronism, you know, like the perfect yeah. example of that. That would have been a lot cooler than what I did. <laughs> I didn't pass out and I probably should have. <laughs> because at least I would have been able to stop. No, it's, it's corsets are no hotter than any other garment. I think that the linen undergarments are the miracle of the whole equation because they do get wet with your sweat and then there is water next to your skin and that water next to your skin keeps you cool. And I remember being in situations where it was, you know, those hundred degree days in the summer and my underclothing was wet and a little breeze came along and I actually got the shivers because I got that cool from the slightest breeze. And that's why they did it because we're talking about time periods where air conditioning didn't exist. If you're wearing a tank top and a pair of shorts, you have a lot of skin that's exposed to the sun and to the heat and you sweat and your sweat evaporates immediately. So not only does your sweat not stay on your skin and keep you cool, but you get dehydrated very quickly. Whereas I'm covered from, you know, neck to ankles and my sweat isn't evaporating. So I'm staying cooler. Wearing a corset on this part of your torso isn't going to make you any hotter than wearing clothes. The Bedouin don't walk around in bathing suits in the Sahara. The Bedouin wear robes from their neck to their wrists to the ground because that's how you keep the coolness inside you. That's how you keep from, from getting overheated. And as for passing out, you know, drink lots of water. And plus the sun protection from the clothes alone is going to just help you so much. Also in the long run, because obviously sunscreen didn't exist. So there are so many practical elements to the fact that people wore yeah. that much clothing. It really was to protect your skin, to make sure you know that you didn't get that sun exposure, you didn't get burned, you weren't in pain. Uh -huh. Linen corsets were really popular in the summer. Like you would have a one or two layer linen corset 
and that would be just perfect because it would be like linen on top of linen. I want to give a massive thank you to Cass McGann for sitting down today and discussing some of the most common corset myths. On top of checking out Reconstructing History's patterns, be sure to give Cass McGann's YouTube page a visit, which I've linked down in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I want to hear your thoughts on this very important discussion surrounding corsetry, so please let me know in the comments down below and I'll see you all in the next video.